Um, so good morning and, and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Um, the first part of our meeting is our department meeting. And um, Dr. Uh, Balaj Zenitz is going to talk about the deterioration index, which is something that will be turned live and folks will see on inpatients starting next week. So I wanted people to see what it was. Without further ado, Dr. Zenitz. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parak. So uh, let me start with the Emila Show style uh, bluff. Uh, just, just really just go through the, the main points first and then I'll give you a little bit more of explanation. Deterioration index in a, is, is an early warning system uh, that will be deployed uh, next week as, as, as Brad just mentioned. And I'm gonna show the keynotes uh, knowledge builder first, uh, some sections of it. This is a one page document that uh, is going to be distributed, was already uh, distributed. But anyhow, so this is a, a tool for adult patients it's a predictive analytic model in, uh, in EPIC uh, that we deployed in CareConnect. It runs every 20 minutes on every hospitalized patient. So I'm gonna get a little bit more specifics. And it predicts outcomes for the next 12 to 36 hours as far as uh, ICU transfer or, or death. Uh, similar to Muse, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in several aspects is better that I describe later. It captures 17 variables uh, 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 over the last 72 hours on patients. And again, this is sort of age, vital size, uh, different nursing assessment tools and parameters. It is, it, it, it can, it is visible uh, across several uh, uh, sections of the chart uh, on patient list on storyboard. Uh, there are summary reports, uh, there are specific uh, 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 system lists uh, that, that, that describe this and so on. Uh, and also there are active alerts to the nursing team, to the bedside nurse, and, and even it can send alerts uh, to the, the unit or other rapid response uh, uh, type uh, team at various hospitals. The score is, uh, is a low, moderate or high risk for deterioration. Again, 46 uh, and 55 are the two thresholds. Uh, but again, this is very visual, uh, uh, so you don't need to memorize that. This is, this is really what it does when the BPA fires, then an alert fires that the deterioration index is high. It can, it can fire for moderate, it can fire for high, and it can also fire for rapidly increasing scores that, again, I will discuss later. But what happens if, it, if, if the BPA pops up? It only pops up for the nurse, and uh, they're going to have uh, their, what they need to do is display it in front of them. If it's something chronically elevated and they know about it and there's no change, they can dismiss the alert. Otherwise, uh, they should uh, uh, notify the provider and, and write a, a quick note what exactly happened. If the provider uh, finds it themselves or the nurse calls them, you can see it many places in the chart and you can re review the graph, you can review the, the, the parameters and just really you know, figure out if there is something that is new, is it something that is unexpected? If it is, just practice medicine. Uh, you know, you decide whether or not you can make a decision uh, from the distance. So you, you assess the patient uh, from the bedside. And obviously that depends on how unexpected, how high the score is and, and uh, what the components are. Really, this is just an extra vital sign because as we know, the, the, when vital signs actually deteriorate, that, that is often too late uh, uh, to, to change the course. And this just gives you an earlier uh, notification that, that there is a chance that something will, uh, uh, will go wrong. Again, this is a tool to, to assess the right patient at the right time. It does not determine clinical course. It does not determine your specific actions at, at this implementation. <clears throat> Again, this is independent from sepsis score and, and Coronalog and, and the team uh, uh, did a great uh, uh, job of, of figuring out that this is not firing duplicate alerts, actually overlapping alerts from the sepsis score and the deterioration index score uh, is, uh, is, is rare, but it, it will function in the EMR similarly to the sepsis alert. It will fire less often though, uh, which I will uh, discuss later. So why we do this? And there was a quality improvement request uh, to, to implement an early warning system. There were uh, bad outcomes and our quality team uh, looks at it and, and thought that this may help. Uh, pediatric already use PUSE, uh, but it's only apl uh, applicable for uh, pedi uh, pediatric patients and they were looking for something for adults. And uh, again, that, that was discussed with the critical care advisor group uh, when the request came and the original consideration was to implement MUSE, but then uh, evaluated the EPIC deterioration index tools seemed to be a better. And that was actually made this a slider last summer. 
Uh, and also, uh, as, as Pratt mentioned, this is a tool that may help in, in capacity management uh, when, when the situation gets dire uh, with very sick people on the floor, which was the case in COVID uh, wave two, and hopefully it's not going to be the case in wave three, but, but we don't know yet. And uh, there is some data that, is, that helps. There was lots of lots of people involved. These are uh, mostly providers on this uh, uh, page, and there's many, many nurses who were involved in, uh, in developing this tool. Again, Epic developed the tool itself, but how to implement it at Rochester Regional, why, what to do with the tool was a really broad coalition. As you may notice, I'm not uh, part of the project uh, team. So if you have questions, I'm gonna to need to ask you to follow up with Karan for very specific uh, discussions. So this is was the original request for some use. Uh, it is six variable. This is what uh, university uh, uses south of the highway. Uh, uh, many systems Epic moved to use to deterioration index because of uh, benefits. There are some studies showing uh, different uh, benefits of that uh, mixed results, whether it improves mortality or just length of stay. Uh, a, 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 a trial that came out in November in the middle of this project going live showed that combination this with a, with a form of rapid response team actually uh, reduces mortality. So that is something that we may consider uh, in the future. Uh, the deterioration index, as I mentioned, 17 variables. Uh, it's, it's an algorithm that is more detailed than Muse. Uh, you don't need to calculate it. The computer automatically calculates it for you. And it had a better uh, uh, ROC and the area under curve uh, was 0.95 for mortality production versus 0.88 for MUSE and for composite outcome, which includes ICU transfer escalation of care uh, uh, codes, uh, codes is again, is, 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 is better than, than the MUSE system. Uh, again, uh, many uh, systems found significant improvement in operation and, and, and provider and nurse satisfaction with this tool. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the, the 36 hour and there was a study showing that this, this is applicable to COVID patients and some organizations actually tried to use not just the high scores to escalate care, but also the low scores to de-escalate uh, uh, care when uh, the hospital is full and, and, and tried to use it for uh, triaging for discharge. Uh, again, what the system does, it tells you a high likelihood of near-term poor prognosis and the project team made decisions how to actually implement this. Uh, there were many ways of, of, of using a number, of course, in the chart that tells you that this patient may deteriorate. Uh, what the decision here was to do a passive non-interruptive workflow showing in, in several lists, uh, census list, storyboard, et cetera. I'm gonna show examples of that. Uh, monitor the list centrally so people can actually not just looking at their patients or, or their ward and, and find people with high deterioration score, but centrally monitor patients specifically for their deterioration scores. Use the existing communication channel, as I mentioned, bedside nurse calling the provider and uh, in it, uh, uh, you know, set, have uh, set different thresholds for moderate and high scores, and uh, uh, there is high and, and high and rapidly uh, increasing scores can uh, uh, create a text message uh, to the ICU charge uh, team. And at Rochester General, it's going to be uh, going to medical patients to the ICU team and surgical patient to the CQ team. So this was the project. Uh, the, the data in the project is, uh, uh, was validated over four months locally uh, from June to October. In that time, more than 20,000 patients records uh, was reviewed. Just uh, out of curiosity, the, 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 the randomized control trial that was published uh, in 2014 had uh, barely more than 500 patients when they, they looked for uh, you know, performance of that. We in-house uh, uh, verified this for more than 20,000 people. Again, this is run and displayed for uh, patients who were admitted to the hospital, not ED, not observation, but admitted uh, for two hours at least, and excludes, excludes patients who are already in the intensive care unit. Uh, the outcomes that were evaluated were mortality. And in one outcome, the other was the composite outcome mortality and adverse event that was defined by ICU transfer here. <coughs> And uh, the, the different thresholds for when to fire a moderate or high risk alert were discussed. So this is the data. Uh, this is how the, the uh, ROC was calculated. Uh, in this 20,000 people, there was 626 death. This is mortality. And again, of course, if you look at all this, uh, you know, a score of zero would capture all of them, but again, it would identify 22,000 uh, patients. I cannot see my own screen here, but uh, 
uh, there is different thresholds and you can use a threshold wherever you want, but the team figured out that firing these 3000 alerts uh, uh, for moderate uh, that identified 506 out of the 626 uh, uh, patients uh, 36 hours uh, prior to mortality uh, resulted in 80% sensitivity and, uh, and one of uh, eight uh, persons that the alert fired actually died. So this was uh, considered a moderate level of alert and the high level of alert that was set at 55, a score of 55 uh, resulted in 1700 alerts, meaning that one in four alert actually uh, resulted in, uh, in death and that, that had a 67% sensitivity. Again, this is just any other test when, when you change the threshold, the, the, the sensitivity and specificity change uh, and, and there is always trade-offs. So this, these are the two cutoffs that, that, that we decided. The 46 and 55 are not written in stone. This is something that the project team decided that, that uh, these levels of alerts and this amount of sensitivity is, uh, is, is, is acceptable. Uh, for composite outcome, again, the same scores re resulted in the same number of alerts. Uh, one in two patients for the, for the high uh, threshold actually either died or required ICU transfer and 30% uh, of them in, in the moderate uh, scenario. Again, this is what we talk about. This is 4,000 alert uh, uh, in, in four months. It's not, uh, you know, it's not nothing, but it's definitely much fewer than sepsis and many other scores. So these are uh, some areas where you can see it. It's gonna be on the storyboard. You can create system lists. Either you can combine with the sepsis score or you can discuss it. Uh, you can just describe itself. When you hover over it, the graph will show up. It will show you the previous score and how it changed and describes what, what parameters and at what percentage they weighed in, into creating the score. When you open it up, it's gonna open up in this accordion report, uh, similar to sepsis, this is deterioration score underneath. You can see that the scores are actually changing pretty differently. This is the same patient. And at the bottom of this, you're gonna see what the score and the predicted probability of outcome, how they align. So it's not gonna be any secret. As you can see, a, a score of 75 has 90% chance of death or ICU transfer. This is the BPA, and again, uh, uh, there is, uh, I don't know what is the time check, it's probably better to hurry up, so I'm not going to get through the, the, what the BPA does, but the nurses actually have those tools that we discussed, they have specific actions that jump up for them, uh, what they need to do, recheck vital signs and notify the provider, and then specific uh, discrete documentation on that. These are the knowledge builders, again, if you want to read, there's uh, many more out there. This is the one pager that really describes everything. It's, again, the keynote KBs are something that's an overview, but there is uh, knowledge builders on, on specific uh, features of this that, that uh, you're going to have links to when the communication comes out. And this is my summary slide. So this is a, a, a near real-time detection of st uh, status change that gives us more time to act. Uh, when, the, when a provider comes to run and, you know, 18, 20 patients in the morning, they can figure out where to start the run if anything uh, significant happened. Again, obviously this doesn't capture everything, but it captures uh, uh, quite a few, uh, 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 with, with quite good uh, uh, predictive value, it captures uh, bad outcomes. So it helps you prioritize your work. One of the providers says it doesn't change how I practice, only which room I'm at what time. Uh, the, the unit nurse and, and charge nurses can have an overview about their sick patients as well. Uh, and again, they can also prioritize the work who to look, uh, who to run them more frequently. The ICU team is more aware of, of uh, which patients are coming. We don't wait for uh, uh, other critical values to pop up or, or, or really vital signs become unstable, uh, but we have uh, more time to act. And again, uh, mortality benefit for this uh, was uh, shown in three studies, but there were studies that showed that uh, it does not necessarily improve mortality. We're gonna monitor what actually happens but there are many other benefits in, in process of care. And uh, again, you, you get an earlier opportunity to act on people who have a significant risk of, of deteriorating and, and surprise and unexpected deaths have, have uh, reduced uh, very significantly, uh, giving more time to, to you to, again, either escalate the care or involve palliative care or, or, uh, or just, just watch patients more closely depending you know, how you decide. It's an it's a automated tool that, that is kind of similar to an experienced nurse who just tells you that, hey, this patient doesn't look good. Uh, thank you. I don't know if you have time for questions. Uh, no, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Janet. Um, 
so there, there was one question that I'll ask you. Uh, Dr. Grief asks, how much does the BUN affect the score and will this cause alerts in end-stage renal disease patients? Uh, I, I don't believe that this uh, the system uh, checks, uh, you know, the, the underlying uh, cause okay. and, and acuity of BUN. Again, it looks back for 72 hours, so it does check changes in, in, in size. It, it, so stable elevation and rapid elevation is, is weighted differently, I believe. But again, I was not even part of the of the team, so Karan can answer that question. But uh, I, again, I, I think he's, he's the one who spent uh, six months with yeah. that, and he just told me three days ago that he's at the board meeting this morning. So yeah. that, that level fine. of technical. I, <laughs> I, yeah, I, uh, I think we can have a deeper discussion about this if people want, but mostly I wanted people to know that this is going live next week. So I wanted them to be aware. So I think, I think this is good enough. Uh, we can do something more if there is. Uh, Thank you. I'll pass the question to Karan. Um, so uh, we'll move on to the resident case conference part of our agenda. Um, so I know Dr. Bopana is already uh, sharing his screen and I will ask him to start presenting the case. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Teja Bopano. I'm a second year medical resident. Uh, I'll be presenting today's case conference with uh, Dr. Lerner. Uh, we chose to present on uh, ABP and asthmatics, and uh, the reason we chose to present on this topic is ABP is considered a rare disease in those with asthma or cystic fibrosis, and we believe it's underdiagnosed. Um, sometimes the uh, presentations of ABPA can be confused with uh, worsening of symptoms of asthma, and uh, we hope to and 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 we hope to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, present a case and a diagnosis and go from there. So ABPA is uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Uh, it's a hypersensitivity condition that is uh, that exists in people with asthma, which, and I'll go into this. So our agenda today is uh, to present a case and briefly discuss the epidemiolog epidemiology, pathophysiology, clinical features, the diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so according to the American uh, College of Asthma, uh, Allergy and Immunology, about 25 million Americans have asthma, of which 8% uh, of all adults and about 8% of all children. And uh, asthma of any severity can be complicated or they can present with ABPA. Uh, there's actually no uh, global studies about the prevalence of ABPA, but based on uh, you know, modeling studies that were done using previously published data, the global burden of ABPA is estimated to be about 5 million. And uh, this was based back in 2013. And at least in that study in, in the United States, it was said that it, there were about 175,000 patients diagnosed with ABPA. So, uh, so I'll present, so this is a 41 year old, uh, so I'll start with case presentation. So this is a 41 year old lady who was uh, referred to the pulmonology office from the emergency department. Uh, she was referred because she was found to have a right Tyler mass with uh, associated right upper lobe atelectasis on, on, uh, on a CAT scan. So she went to the ED three days prior with a non-productive cough, uh, which was ongoing for many months and right-sided chest pain, which started three days prior. So she's known to have a history of mild intermittent asthma since childhood. Uh, it, it, it's been well controlled for many years. She's, she used to use her, uh, rest, al her albutrol inhaler maybe once every few months uh, until uh, six months prior to presentation. Notably, she started working at, at Lowe's Garden Center nine months prior to presentation. And six months prior, uh, she started using her rescue, in rescue inhaler more frequently, uh, sometimes up to a few times every day. Three months prior, she reported multiple visits to uh, urgent care as well as the ED. Uh, she reported that, uh, she, and during these visits, she was treated for exacerbations of asthma with short courses of steroids and, uh, and, and uh, antibiotics. Regarding her most recent ED visit, uh, she reported right-sided uh, right sharp pleuritic chest pain, which started three days prior to presentation and an increased frequency of cough, uh, which had been occurring for the past few months, but did worsen uh, over the last three days. 
She had no fevers, chills, myalgias, sore throat or abdominal pain and this visit. Given her presentation in the ED, she, she had a CPP study done uh, to rule out pulmonary embolism. Uh, and this showed a right hilar mass with right upper lobe atelectasis. She was given steroids and, uh, and lantern for five days and was discharged with uh, like close follow-up with the primary care physician as well as pulmonology. Past medical history, uh, asthma and allergic rhinitis, uh, past surgical history, uh, a right oophorectomy in 2008, uh, medications, uh, albuterol and Advair inhalers and loratadine as needed for allergies, family history, uh, asthma and her brother and sister, and uh, social history, never smoker, uh, secondhand smoking exposure from her mother and sister as a kid. Uh, there, her son had a rat at home, but she didn't really have anything to do with this. Uh, it was present in the household, though no birds and no recent travel otherwise. Review of systems, uh, just positive for fatigue, generalized weakness, cough and chest pain, otherwise uh, was negative. Phys physical exam in the, at, in the office, uh, all her vital signs were normal. Her lung exam was also normal. Uh, there, we, no wheezing was appreciated at that visit. Looking at her lab work, which was done three days prior in the ED, uh, her CBC with differential uh, showed, uh, isono showed uh, isonicals of 11% and uh, elevated uh, isonical count of 1.1. Uh, and otherwise, her uh, comprehensive metabolic profile was uh, normal. She had a spirometry done a few months prior to coming in uh, to the pulmonology office. Uh, this was, there, was, there were no bronchodilator uh, studies done at that time, but at least uh, the FEV1 over FVC was 100% and the BLCO was normal, indicating a normal uh, spirometry. So this was the imaging that she had in the ED. Uh, so this was the right Tyler mass, uh, four, four centimeters by 3.4 centimeters, along with the uh, right upper low back like basis, which was noticed. So when she was seen in the office, the assessment at that time was that she had endobronchial mass or mucus plugging or extrinsic compression of the, of the right, up, right upper low bronchus. Uh, serum, total serum IgE and aspergillus fumigatus IgE levels were ordered, and uh, she was scheduled for, for bronchoscopy that same week. I don't have pictures from the bronchoscopy to show, but uh, the, uh, the in the procedure, so she had uh, in the right upper lobe bronchus, so there was collapse with a white thick mucus plug, which was removed with forceps, uh, and the specimen was sent to cytology and microbiology. She was seen in the office one week after the bronchoscopy was done for follow-up uh, and an x-ray was done prior, which showed that the right upper lobe uh, opacity noted previously was improving. And uh, her total serum immunoglobulin uh, E levels was elevated at 18, 88. The aspergillus cubingatus IgE was elevated at 58 and the microbiology uh, isolated aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, she met the criteria for ABP, which I will go into. And um, so she was started on prednisone, 20 milligrams daily, and uh, itraconazole uh, for ABP and ABP associated endobronchial aspergilloma. One month later, uh, she was feeling well, but she was gaining weight. Uh, so her prednisone dose was decreased to 10 milligrams daily, and the it itraconazole was continued. She was referred to allergy for consideration of uh, injectable monoclonal antibodies. Three months later, uh, she had stopped taking the itraconazole on her own and now felt that, and now reports that she felt worse. She had some headaches and what she described as a head fog. Uh, the itraconazole was restarted uh, by, as per pulmonology, and then uh, her primary care physician ordered a CT head uh, to evaluate her symptoms of headache. Uh, and a sputum culture was ordered. Both uh, the CT head and sputum culture uh, didn't show anything, didn't have any findings. Six months later, she, can, she had multiple episodes of sinus congestion, runny nose, myalgias, and fatigue. Uh, she, uh, she was treated for sinusitis uh, and failed multiple courses of oral antibiotics. During this time, she continued to work at Lowe's. Uh, and she was, because of her multiple episodes of 
uh, sinusitis, she was referred to ENT. So ENT got a CT scanner for sinuses, uh, which showed uh, left-sided sinusitis. Uh, so this shows a classification of her uh, ethmoidal air cells. Uh, and uh, she ended up having uh, uh, endoscopic ethmoidectomy uh, to treat for treatment. And uh, the interop cultures from this uh, procedure for Aspergilla species as well. Given uh, her history of now uh, Aspergillus, allergic Aspergillus sinusitis, as well as AVPA, she, would, she ended up seeing infectious disease for recurrent aspergillus infections. Uh, the, it, it was thought that her presentations were due to exacerbations of AVPA and allergic aspergillus sinusitis. And she was started on a three month course of vitroconazole, uh, again, with improvement in her symptoms. Uh, 11 months later, she finally saw allergy uh, and was plan was to start on omalizumab, uh, IgE, monoclonal antibody for better symptom control. Uh, during this time, uh, she, uh, during the 11 month to three year period, she had multiple exacerbations, again, requiring, uh, requiring systemic uh, steroids and she remained on chronic steroid therapy during all this time. Uh, and otherwise, she had multiple bacterial infection, uh, pneumonias, growing pseudomonas in staph. This we thought was a red flag, but well, a red herring rather. But uh, you know, ge genetic testing for cystic fibrosis was done, and uh, she was found to be a cystic fibrosis carrier, an atypical variant. Uh, she was referred to a cystic fibrosis center for further evaluation for this. Uh, she ended up not going to follow up with them, but. Um, we just thought this was something that came up and unlikely related to her ABP. Uh, so in summary, 41-year-old lady uh, with, you know, mild intermittent asthma for a very long time. Uh, and now, uh, you know, it's a change in environment, new job, uh, suddenly pr presents with worsening symptoms and diagnosed with ABPA. And over a three-year period, three period, essentially now becomes a, a glucocorticoid dependent uh, uh, has group corticoid dependent AV. Uh, so uh, discussion, I, I'll, so before I speak specifically about AVPA, uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, it's just important to understand the spectrum of aspergillosis. So aspergillus is a, is a fungi. Uh, there are about 160 different species that are known. Uh, and, you know, these are present in the environment all around us. However, only a very minority of uh, people get disease or have uh, disease as a result of aspergillus. So the, what, how do, how the reason people get disease is it depends on their uh, immune function, whether, Im whether they're immunosuppressed or not. And uh, if they have, um, and their genetics, if they're high, if they have some sort of hypersensitivity or not. So you have, uh, you know, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, which is an entity that exists in people who were immunosuppressed whether this is because they have, um, whether as a result of neutropenia, uh, you know, they have uh, leukemia or something, they're undergoing chemotherapy, solid organ transplants on chemotherapy. Um, and these are people who are usually in the hospital, they're very sick. Uh, then you have chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, which is a more of an indolent disease, uh, presents with fevers, weight loss, mostly people who have uh, normal immune function but they may have some lung disease. Uh, in, in the developing world, this is due to, for example, tuberculosis and you have scarring of your lungs, you know, and in more developed countries, it's, it's maybe people with bronchiectasis or COPD. And these are people who have uh, either aspergilloma balls with aspergillus balls within these pre-existing lung cavities, or it could be due to uh, uh, aspergillus nodule. And then you finally have ABPA, which is due to uh, hypersensitivity. This exists only in people with asthma and cystic fibrosis. So the epidemiology of ABPA is, is really not known at this point. It was first described in, 19, in 1952. And um, most of the figures that, that are available are for people who attend asthma clinics. So for example, in um, you know, among patients who attend asthma clinics, uh, the aspergillus sensitization was between six and 40%. And the prevalence of ABPA among this population was between two and 20%. Uh, 
The number of cases diagnosed is increasing in the last two to three decades as a result of heightened physician awareness and then the, the widespread availability of serologic testing. So uh, pathophysiology, uh, in a, a while ago, it was thought that the environment had a lot to play with uh, development of ABP. But then it was found that if you had two people with asthma within the same environment, one person would, would develop ABP and the other wouldn't. So uh, it was thought that there was a genetic predisposition to it. So the, the fungi that is uh, respond is uh, pathognomic for ABP is Aspergillus fumigatus. So you have these spores in the environment. Uh, and in our, in our patient, for example, she worked in the garden center where there's, there's a lot of such spores in the environment. Uh, these spores become uh, trapped within this, in the secretions, uh, causing growth of hyphae. And um, what happens there is that now you have uh, antigens and proteases which, uh, which are uh, formed. And the proteases cause uh, damage to airways. And then you have antigens, which are processed by the antigen presenting cells and which cause a, a, a T helper two CD4 response. So you end up having production of these uh, uh, inflammatory, these, key, these markers in, in, in of uh, release of interleukin four, five and 13. Uh, these both, both the uh, cellular response as well as the uh, innate response uh, end up causing increased IgE levels. Uh, you have uh, pulmonary inflammation, and then you have tissue damage and airway remodeling, which is what happens in ABPA. Uh, clinical features, mostly nonspecific, uh, but, uh, you know, but it's thought the low-grade fevers, wheezing, breathlessness, um, hemoptysis, and or productive cough. And this is this is classic for ABPA, the expectoration of um, mucus plugs. And um, then you have, you need to keep in mind that the upper respiratory tract sinuses can also be affected. And sometimes this can precede uh, development of ABPA. Nothing specific on physical exam. You can hear, so you can, about 15% of patients can have clubbing and coarse crackles. Uh, and you can hear some polyphonic wheezing. So how is the diagnosis made? This was a challenge for a long time because um, there were many uh, different criteria that existed for, uh, for diagnosing ABP. And um, they were very specific. And sometimes, you know, uh, it was hard to make the diagnosis simply because they didn't fit all these uh, criteria. Uh, this was until 2013 when um, this, uh, this uh, criteria was made, the International Society of Human and Animal Mycology. Uh, so this made it very simple. So firstly, you need to have a predisposing, uh, you need to either have asthma or cystic fibrosis. Then you need to have both these obligatory criteria, your serum IgE level greater than 1000 and a positive uh, skin test or increased IgE antibody to aspergillus. And then two of the following three supportive criteria, uh, peripheral eosinophilia greater than 500, uh, precipitants or increased IgG antibody to aspergillus, and then uh, consistent radiographic opacities. Uh, and with this, it became a little easier to make the diagnosis. Uh, just a brief uh, mention about staging. Uh, so you have uh, six stages. Uh, stage zero is asymptomatic, and this is when people are, uh, people are you know, diagnosed with ABPA when they're routinely investigated. But most people usually present with the stage one, meaning acute, ex acute, this is their first presentation as it was in our case. So it's based on CT and or bronchoscopic findings of mucoid infection as was seen in our, in our patient. Then you have a response. You start them on treatment. They improve uh, with decrease in their serum uh, IgE levels at eight weeks. Then stage three is exacerbation uh, where you have uh, increase in their level again uh, up to 50% of baseline. You treat them, you treat the exacerbation, they go into remissions, which is stage four. Uh, but then stage five is where Our Lady ended up. You have uh, treatment-dependent ABP and glucocorticoid-dependent uh, asthma, uh, which both exist. And then finally, stage six is advanced ABPA. 
which are when someone has clinical signs of uh, a respiratory failure along with radiologic features of fibrosis. Uh, Dr. Lerner will discuss the treatment of ABP now. I think I'm sharing now. Um, that was an excellent uh, presentation. I want to thank you, Tasia, for inviting me to be a part of your talk. This has actually been a welcome respite from uh, COVID uh, to be able to actually uh, circle back and focus on pulmonary medicine for a while. So the treatment of ABPA is um, often challenging. Uh, as a relatively rare disease, there's not a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials to um, guide therapy. And so uh, most of this is um, expert opinion and clinical experience. So of course, what are our treatment um, goals uh, when we're treating ABPA? Of course, we wanna uh, maintain control of the underlying symptoms of the asthma or cystic fibrosis, or in some cases, lung disease that has been a setup <clears throat> for the ABPA. Uh, we need to uh, maintain vigilance to both recognize this disease, uh, recognizing that it's underdiagnosed uh, likely, um, both prevent uh, and treat pulmonary exacerbations of ABPA with the idea that if we can prevent them early, we'll reduce the um, progression to structural lung disease. Um, of course, reduce and remit pulmonary inflammation, which is linked with the idea of uh, preventing that fibrotic process. Um, and then finally, limit steroid exposure. We all know that uh, steroids are a double-edged sword. We love them and we hate them. They are uh, an uh, amazing tool for treatment of lung disease, but the adverse effects of steroid are um, profound. Okay, so that's advancing. So the cornerstone of treatment of ABPA is steroids, um, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, they remain the most effective drug for treating ABPA. So the dosing schedule and the duration of therapy remain poorly defined, but in general, you can say that the treatment uh, for ABPA is probably what we consider a intermediate dosing range for steroids. So around uh, half a milligram per kilogram per day is a reasonable place to start. Um, and the taper from that, uh, if a person is going to respond, would be somewhere between three to six months course of steroids. Of course, always trying to find the lowest effective dose. The good news in ABPA is that treatment response does track with IgE levels. So we can follow an IgE level as well as a radiographic response and clinical response. And in general, the uh, thought is that when we see that IgE decrease by about 35%, then we're comfortable tapering and that taper can be about uh, by you know, two to five milligrams every couple of weeks up to three to six months. Unfortunately, we do have some patients who are very dependent and our mantras always find the lowest effective dose and then uh, consider adjunct therapy in those cases. So where do antifungal agents fit in the care of uh, these folk? It's been debated over the years and it's not, uh, has not been <clears throat> established firmly. My idea is that it's an adjunct uh, therapy and it probably serves a little bit different role than um, the steroids. The steroids are focused on reducing the inflammation, and the steroids uh, work both by directly um, uh, killing the uh, disease burden and um, also reducing the antigenic um, uh, exposure to these patients. Remember um, back to the pathophysiology slide that uh, these folks probably, uh, due to their underlying uh, asthmatic phenotype, have a tendency to have a much more robust Th2 response as opposed to a Th1. And again, that sends their inflammatory pathway down the um, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13 pathway. And so they're increasing their production of IgE, but also what is a part of that is they're reducing their production of uh, IgA in their uh, BAL fluid. And the IgA is critical in, in um, eliminating spores. So these folk do have a relative immune deficiency uh, to killing these fungal spores. So I see the antifungal treatment as really an adjunct in helping them along uh, in that pathway, as well as reducing that burden. 
so I'd say most commonly I would use the steroids if we're un or uh, antifungals if we're one, unable to wean steroids. Two, um, when limiting steroid use is a high priority, like for weight gain, uh, diabetes, osteoporosis. In this case, as a young woman, she was very sensitive about weight gain and was experiencing weight gain. So we uh, used antifungal therapy probably more than uh, the guidelines recommend. And then again, when there's a large burden of acidulis, which clearly in this case, he um, again and again uh, grew uh, abundant aspergillus. So um, again, our clinical trial data is limited, but this is probably the trial that's used most commonly uh, in treating uh, ABPA. This was published in New England Journal in 2000. It's a randomized controlled trial of um, as, uh, use of itraconazole twice daily in, six, in, in steroid dependent patients with ABPA. So remember, these are patients who are stuck on their steroids. So these folk were randomized to either placebo or uh, itraconazole twice daily for 16 weeks. And the response was defined as either a reduction in their steroid use, uh, a decrease of at least 25% in that serum IgE concentration, and one of the following, either an improvement of at least 25% in their exercise tolerance or pulmonary function test uh, improved. So this is the data. You'll see right off, this was only 50 some patients, uh, which, and it got itself into the New England Journal, which speaks to the quality of data in ABPA in general. Uh, so, and it showed that their overall response was greater in the itraconazole group. So this uh, trial showed that uh, the itraconazole, or by extension, voriconazole, which is a much easier steroid to use, uh, has a role as a steroid sparing agent uh, in ABPA. So how do we define treatment uh, response in uh, ABPA? So we like to see radiographic clearing, uh, a total IgE uh, decline of greater than 50%, realizing that in, in remission, uh, yeah, the IgE can often go back to baseline. So that speaks to uh, screening folk for a tendency for ABPA. If you're looking for it uh, during asymptomatic time, you might not be finding it. Um, and also peripheral EOs might, uh, eosinophils might decline back to the normal range. So uh, what we recommend is as far as monitoring for a clinical response is that when steroids uh, and treatment are started to get a IgE level every uh, one to two months, four to eight weeks uh, and monitor uh, uh, treatment and start uh, steroid tapering again when we see that 35% drop. IgE. So what do we define as a remission? So if we can have someone off steroids for at least six months, uh, noted that they should remain on their inhaled corticosteroids because of course the underlying asthma um, or possibly cystic fibrosis uh, could require that ICS. Uh, when someone's in remission, we still recommend uh, checking that IgE every three to six months unless they have a, dur a durable remission and then that can of course be spaced out as clinically indicated. We still recommend annual spirometry and important to recognize that there's really no role for chronic suppressive antifungal therapy uh, or uh, chronic oral corticosteroids if you're able to reach a remission. Uh, and then monitoring during remission again every three to six months, the IgE. Uh, if you, we are monitoring during a remission and we see a doubling of the IgE, this suggests a flare. And this is important to recognize because up to 35% of exacerbations uh, defined by radiographic imaging and serology are actually asymptomatic. And we do favor treating those. Uh, we think if we treat early, we can reduce the steroid dosing um, required over the course of a lifetime and also prevent that progression to a fibrotic uh, lung disease. So uh, as far as adjunct therapy and additional steroid uh, sparing agents, uh, we have the most data on omalizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against IgE. Um, studies have been done in patients with underlying CF and have demonstrated a significant clinical improvement with reduction in both hospitalization and exacerbations and limiting the use of oral corticosteroids. 
Finally, uh, you know, when you look at the pathophysiology of ABPA and realize that uh, they have such a heightened IL-4, 5, and 13 response, it only makes sense that the other monoclonal antibodies targeting uh, these uh, interleukins uh, like dupilumab, which uh, focuses on IL-4, 5, and 13, or mepolizumab, um, or uh, benrolizumab, which focus on uh, IL-5, um, are seem an obvious solution. At this uh, point, the data is only uh, case reports of a handful of cases, but they're quite promising. And of course, uh, these, while there's no specific randomized control trials for ABPA in these medicines, these folk often uh, fit the criteria for poorly controlled severe asthma just by their steroid dependence. So they would qualify for these medications just based on the poorly controlled under asthma. So in summary for treatment, uh, uh, steroids are the mainstay of therapy. We always look for uh, the lowest effective dose uh, to treat these folks with uh, steroids. In general, we start around a half a milligram per kilogram daily, tapered over three to six months based on the clinical response and the IgE levels. Steroids, uh, oh, sorry, typo there. Uh, antifungals are an adjunct therapy, primarily used as steroid sparing agents or if there's a large fungal burden. Itraconazole uh, is, of course, what has been published on, but voriconazole is broadly used as it is uh, far easier um, tolerated and um, easier to follow um, as far as clinical outcomes. And again, we recommend that you, uh, when a person is in uh, remission, that we actively monitor for relapse, whatever, with an IgE every three to six months. So prognosis for um, ABPA. So again, the natural history of the prognosis of ABPA is not well characterized. Um, I suspect that it's a change in target, that as we recognize uh, this disease, um, and have better tools for monitoring it through IgE and clinical um, monitoring. Uh, the hope is that we will see much less of the um, progression to central bronchiectasis and fibrotic lung disease uh, that we had seen in the past. Um, and of course, if ABP is diagnosed and treated before the development of this bronchiectasis, we can pretty much uh, this. Uh, a brief mention of cystic fibrosis and ABPA. Um, I mentioned earlier that our patient um, was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis uh, late, somewhat late in her course um, of treatment for ABPA. She, she was an atypical uh, carrier, um, actually had a positive sweat test, so she uh, does meet the criteria for, AB, or for uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, and uh, so she's an interesting case that has both cystic fibrosis and uh, underlying asthma. Um, the criteria for diagnosing ABPA in cystic fibrosis is similar, but what's important in management and treatment is that these folk uh, have bronchiectasis for other reasons, and often uh, they have um, uh, chronic infections, and so an exacerbation is much harder to separate uh, from bacterial versus ABPA, so it makes the uh, management of these folk a bit trickier. Um, and so for screening, uh, the recommendation is that there's no clear role for screening for ABPA in all asthmatics. Uh, we need to maintain a high index of suspicion for this in um, severe asthmatics, asthmatics that have a worsening um, of their control uh, or um, are uh, become steroid dependent. Uh, at that point, we recommend uh, screening uh, for ABPA with an IgE level or a specific IgE uh, to aspergillus. Um, however, it's a little bit different in cystic fibrosis. They do recommend uh, screening and maintaining a high index of suspicion for this in uh, patients over six years old. Uh, and they do recommend uh, screening, checking the total IgE uh, once a year. And with that, I will turn uh, this back over to any questions uh, from the audience. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so the one question I see out there is, 
did she stop working at Lowe's? <laughs> did she stop working at the garden center? I think aspergillus is ubiquitous, right? It's in your backyard. You don't have yeah. to be close to get it any. She continued to work. She loved that job. So we we agonized over that quite a bit. And um, uh, two struggles for her. One, she loved that position. Um, and uh, two, there was a lot of financial uh, issues and she was not in a position to take a leave uh, from that position. Maybe four years into her care, uh, she did switch and she's cleaning rooms uh, at a hotel now. So the other question here that showed up uh, for Dr. Lerner is the spirometry for this lady showed no obstruction with ABPA likely in the clinical situation, would you have offered cystic fibrosis screening earlier? Oh, so, so it, it, would I have offered CF screening earlier. when she was diagnosed? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, if it had not shown obstruction, would I have? Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, I, um, I was a bit humble that she ended up having CF and it was so late in her care that we recognized it. I think, you know, diagnosis of adult CF is always challenging. It, what triggered me or my aha moment with her was, uh, you know, first she had the aspergillus and, you know, it was a pretty straightforward ABPA case. And then she grew staph. I thought, well, that's kind of weird. So she has staph and she has aspergillus. And we treated that. And maybe a few months later, she, we got more speed cultures and it grew pseudomonas. And then I thought, oh, <laughs> staph, pseudomonas, aspergillus. Okay, I better do some um, testing here. And she, you know, she um, had this atypical variant and Humbling. Yeah. Um, so cystic fibrosis carrier is, is not that uncommon a state, right? People of European descent, it's what, like 3% or something mm -hmm. like that? For the most common, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's Northern European. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, seeing no other questions and only about five minutes left on our time. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers and see you all next week.